So, uh, where things left off last time was talking about seesaws. I, I kind of got as far as one rider on a seesaw, and life, it's not very fun on one, one, one ride on the seesaw because it, it rotates, it undergoes angular acceleration, and you end up, the, the one rider ends up on the ground. Uh, just to finish that, those thoughts, there's a Newton's second law for rotation, just as there is for translation. And that second law relates the cause, which is torque, in particular net torque, the overall torque that, that an object experiences, in this case the seesaw, and the seesaw's overall rotational mass. So you, if you take the torque and divide it by the rotational mass, the resistance to that torque, you get the angular acceleration, the rate at which the angular velocity of the seesaw changes with time. And it's the same as Newton's second law, just the rotational quantities rather than translational quantities. Questions about that idea? The torques cause angular acceleration, rotational mass resists it, they fight each other out, and you end up with, with angular acceleration. Anything? All right. So the, so the single rider on the seesaw, the seesaw, when I let go of this, the seesaw will experience a, a torque. It's actually a torque. I, I need both hands, but it's a, I need, at least in the right hand. It's a torque away from us, and the seesaw undergoes angular acceleration <laughs> away from us until, until the rider hits the ground. Then there, there are more torques. The story changes. Well, just to, to, to illustrate this sort of one more time, Mini-Me, where's Mini-Me? There's Mini-Me. Mini-Me is pretty old. Back when I made Mini-Me, I had, I didn't have gray hair. So there's Mini-Me. And so the question is, if we smack Mini-Me with a mallet, because why not? And we want Mini-Me to undergo clockwise angular acceleration. This is from your perspective. So we want angular acceleration that is clockwise, which is you know, clockwise and counterclockwise. It, that's another convention for describing rotations. Um, it, instead of using the right-hand rule and, and using uh, directions, you, it, you say clockwise and counterclockwise. And presumably, you still learn this, even though nobody, nobody has analog clocks anymore, let alone, you know, they don't even, don't even have watches. It's, it's pretty sad. But anyway, so that's, that's, in a sense, clockwise angular acceleration is the same as angular acceleration away from us in, in addition to a different convention for naming it. So how do we do that? Should I, should I tap Mini-Me on the top of his head toward his feet? How many thinks that will make him undergo the right angular acceleration? Okay. No, I mean, you, can see, you can see that won't work because that's a force exerted out here with a lever arm. There's a lever arm between the pivot and the head, but we're exerting the force along the lever arm, and opposite it, basically. And that, that doesn't help. How about hit the side of his head toward your right? Yeah, we're, you're good. OK, I mean, it's easy. We're not very good. Okay. So we get the right angular acceleration. One of these days, his head will come off. He's, he's threatening to come off altogether. Stay on. OK, so during the, the brief period when there was a force exerted on, on Minnie Me's head toward the right, we had a lever arm. We had a force perpendicular to that lever arm. That's all good for, for creating a torque. And it was the right torque. It was you know, according to right-hand rules and stuff. But, you, but your intuition will tell you that will cause a twist this way. If we follow the other choices, tap the middle of his body toward the right, you don't get anything because the force is, again, right toward the pivot. And lastly, if you tap the side of his feet toward your right, you get angular acceleration, but the wrong direction. And actually, I made Mini-Me for a television show on football way back when. And it was about tackling. So it's, it's past the season, but come next year when you want to watch the tackling. The different places people collide with other players. If you collide with the other player right at the middle, hit them basically at gut level, you don't cause any, any rotation in the player you collide with. There's no torque on the player. But if you hit them low, you tend to knock their feet forward. Their head comes back the opposite way. They rotate this way. So, so you know, strategies for 
for clobbering people. If you hit them low, they rotate one direction. They undergo angular acceleration and begin rotating one direction. If you hit them high, they undergo angular acceleration and in the opposite direction. So you can watch this happen. And during the, in that television show, there, there, there was video footage of people getting hit high, getting hit low, getting hit midsection. You'd, you'd watch them rotate. Um, there are very dramatic images of people basically playing uh, flying mini-me through the air. Is that all OK? Any questions? All right. Well, so we can now look, having dealt with the issue of forces causing torques, pr producing torques. You're all comfortable with that? Forces can produce torques. There's some rules governing it. Incidentally, torques can produce forces as well. So like a lacrosse. When, when someone throws a ball with a lacrosse stick, they're using a rotary motion, rotational motion of the stick, but the ball ends up getting pushed forward. And it's just a, it's the reverse of what I've just discussed, that a rotating motion, a torque exerted on a stick, can produce a force on, say, say the ball. They're related to each other. Um, so we, we, we've got that. Now what if we put more than one rider simultaneously on the seesaw? If we put the rider in the right location, and now I'm going to be picky, we get essentially zero torque. So if, I'm, if I get it just right, we'll get zero torque on the seesaw. You can see it's pretty close to zero. And how do you know that? Because the angular acceleration is very close to zero. Ideally, we get down to, to dead zero, and, it, it, and we get no, no uh, angular acceleration at all. How does this happen? We know this rider is producing a torque on the seesaw. We know this rider is producing a torque on the seesaw. How is it that together they're producing no torque on the seesaw? And the answer is their torques cancel. How's that? This rider produces a torque. And, and the rule, again, is to you go along the lever arm with your, with your index finger, and you rotate in the direction of the force, and your thumb points in the direction of the, the torque. It's away from us. You know, if, you, if you never get the directions under control, it's OK. I mean, just, this will not affect your life five years from now. But understanding that torques cause rotation, cause, and specifically anger exertion, that's hopefully will be of some use to you. So that's a torque away from you. How about this, this rider? This rider has a different lever arm. It's from the pivot to where the rider pushes. It's this direction. And the torque is down, or the force is down. So the torque is toward you. The directions of the two torques are opposite one another. So when you add them, which you, which, which, when you add, they're vector quantities. When you add them, you have to take direction into account. They happen to be equally strong. I, I've, been, I've carefully adjusted it so they are equally strong. But they point in opposite directions. And when you add them, they add to 0. Is that OK? And this, uh, it, Make sure. You, you ask me a question if that doesn't make sense. That the, that the two riders produce torques that sum to zero. Yeah. Uh, they, they balance even though one's down. Um, at this point, there's a third torque on the, on the seesaw. The table's pushing up a little bit on the end of the seesaw. And that's contributing a third torque that is fully balancing everything. Without that third torque, it's a little, it's a little imperfect. You know, see, see, if, if I let go of it now, it undergoes angular acceleration that way, which is toward you. And if I, were, if I wheedle around, I can probably get closer to zero, but I'm not quite there. What all we have was the table contributed the last little bit of torque away from you to cancel the, that, that, that residual, I, 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 my failure to get it perfect. Is that OK? So, so this is when, when playing seesaw. A lot of the time, when you, the two kids are, are the only thing exerting the torques on the seesaw. But when they hit the ground net, or put their feet down, they're getting a, yet another torque that affects the angular acceleration of the seesaw. And that's, that's part of how they make it rotate back and forth. If it was rotating this way, and they want to reverse the torque, one of the kids pushes on the ground, the ground pushes back, and it uh, produces another torque on the seesaw that causes angular acceleration in the opposite, in, in this direction, which is away from us, and, and reverses the direction. So that's, that's the whole game of seesaw, or you know, playing, is, is occasionally getting a, an additional torque that, that reverses the motion of the seesaw. Other questions? 
Um, the reason these two torques cancel, I mean, they're, they're certainly in opposite directions. The issue is, are they the same strengths? They're not quite the same strengths. I'm, I'm a little off. You know, I, can go, I can go a little better. To, to make it a little better, what do I do? I have to reduce. This one's exerting too much torque. I can't change the kid's weight, but I can push the kid a little closer to the pivot, which shortens the lever arm. So let me try it. Can, can you get it? We're almost there. Uh, you know, I'm, I, 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 now that guy's dominant. The pivot, we're supporting it below the bar, which is a little, it's a little bit unstable here. It's not, per, it's not a perfect design for a seesaw. So I can't get a, I can't get a zero and, and keep it because things, things change as it rotates. But anyway, we, now I've got the, the opposite ha happening, where, the, where the, the kid on the right produces more torque by a small margin than the kid on the left. They don't sum to zero. But what matters is the weight and the distance from the pivot. And if you put a kid on that has a huge amount of weight, so there's that kid, of course the kid will uh, produce a giant torque that will dominate completely if you put the kid on the same s the seat, the, the same distance from the pivot. But if the kid moves forward, or maybe that's the, that's the parent, you put the kid at a much smaller lever arm. It can be right on here somewhere. Here, okay. There, there it is. And we're almost at zero again. So even though the weight of this, of the parent, say, is huge by shortening the lever arm, the product of the two, the force times the lever arm, and ensuring they're, they're parallel to one another, perpendicular to one another, you get a small torque that's matched by the, the child at a greater distance. And this sort of, this sort of concept of, of two torques uh, uh, canceling one another to sort of get rid of the anger acceleration it shows up in all kinds of lever situations. Um, you can go, I can go on. I used to, years ago, go on all, all the different levers. That are right. Your, your world is, has many of them, pretty tools, a lot of the tools. The claw hammer for pulling a nail out of a board. Hopefully you've, you've done this once or twice in your life. These things get more and more uh, obscure as the years go by. But you can, you can pull a nail out of a board. How do you do that? Well, you get a claw hammer that grabs the nail very close to the pivot, which is the, where, the, where the claw hammer touches the, the wood. And the nail has a tiny lever arm with which to produce torque. You, on the other hand, are on the handle of the hammer far from the pivot, and you have a long lever arm with which to produce torque. And you and the nail produce torques in opposite directions. As you pull the lever, the, 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 the handle one way, it produces a torque toward you. The little nail pulls the hammer the other way. No, don't, don't pull me out of the wood. I'll pull down. That's a torque away from you. And the two of you come to a approximately zero net torque, but the, because the nail's so close to the pivot, it has to use a huge force to produce its torque. And that force is so big that finally the wood uh, refuses to, to help the nail pull that hard, and the nail comes out of the wood. Hopefully it makes some sense. And so there are lots of other lever type devices that work that same sort of way. Questions about levers or things that you wonder about? They're all going to do these sorts of things. Um, the one, another way I want to look at this, and I want, to just, I want to finish up with seesaws. The seesaw, in the circumstance when the seesaw balances, so let me go, let me go back to the two similar children on the, on the seesaw. When it balances like this, a second way of thinking about what it means to balance is, is this. The seesaw right now consists of the beam and the two kids. And gravity is pulling on each of them independently. In fact, the, the, the gravity is pulling a little bit on the, this kid's head, this kid's feet, the, the, bar, the bar area here, the bar area there. Gravity is exerting forces on all these different parts of that seesaw with kids. Is there an effective location which you can say gravity is pulling? The whole thing. Just one point. Forget all the details. And the answer is yes. Gravity is effectively acting at what is known as the center of gravity of this, of this object. So center of gravity means the effective location of an object's weight for sort of all practical purposes. Um, you have a center of gravity. It's, it's somewhere in, in, in the middle of your gut. 
uh, assuming you're standing up. If you're, if you're, if you're shaped differently, you, the center of gravity can be moved around because of how, the, how your weight is distributed around that in you. But everything's got a center of gravity. A ball has a center of gravity pretty much at its center. And so on. Center of gravity is, a, is associated with, with gravity and weight. I talked yesterday, well, you know, Wednesday, about another center, center of mass, which is the effective location of an object's mass, the, the point about which all the mass is sort of balanced. Center of gravity is the point which all weight is balanced. Center of mass is the point about which mass is balanced. You understand the difference between them? One's a weight issue and gravity-based, and one of them's inertia is issue, inertial issue. It's mass-based. They happen to be in the coincide at the same point for ordinary objects here to the surface of the Earth. And I, I, it would be nice if I could say they're always the same point, but there are exceptions on the sort of celestial scale. The example I have in mind is the, is the moon. The moon's center of mass is pretty much dead center in the middle of the moon. If you took the moon off anywhere you like, where it is now, off in deep space, whatever you want to do with the moon, and you rotationally shook it or spun it, it would spin around its center of mass. That's its natural pivot. It's right, pretty much dead center. That's, so that's an inertial issue. It doesn't have anything to do with gravity. How about the moon's center of gravity? Well, the gravity, the, the, the celestial objects exert significant gravity on, on one another. The Earth, in particular, exerts a, a whopping gravitational force on the moon. So when you go looking for the center of gravity of the moon, it's really Forget the sun is there, and it's also important, but let's just focus on the, on the Earth exerting gravity on the moon. It does exert a force on the moon. The moon has a weight, an Earth weight, a weight due to the Earth. And where is that center of gravity located? Well, you might think it would be dead center in the middle of the Earth. And that would be true, except gravity has this property that it, that it decreases with distance. You know, I, I claim that here to the surface of the Earth, it's constant. Your weight, your weight down here is the same as your weight up here. And that's pretty nearly perfectly true. Not quite. It's, a it's an approximation. As you go farther and farther up, your weight gets less and less. And I talked about this, that, that, that you can lose weight by, by going into the mountains. It's true. You really lose the weight. It's, you, you, a properly designed scale would say, no, you lost a little weight. So the same thing with the moon. If you put an astronaut on the near side of the moon, and weigh, they'll have an Earth weight. If you put them on the far side of the moon, they'll have an Earth weight again, but it'll be a little smaller because they're farther from the center of the Earth. You visualize that? So the moon itself actually experiences this effect. The near side of the moon is pulled a little harder, develops a little more weight per, per kilogram than the far side of the moon. And as a result, the, Earth's, the moon's center of gravity is the point about which the, the, the weight is effectively balanced, distributed, is a little closer to us than its geometrical center. And this has all kinds of implications. This is in part, you, you've noticed that, that the same surface of the moon points toward us all the time. People talk about the, the, the dark side of the moon and the light side of the moon as though they are constant. They're not. As the, Earth, as the moon goes around us, uh, they have sunrise, it has sunrise, sunset, but there's no constant dark side of the moon. There is a constant far side of the moon, though. The back side of the moon is never visible from Earth because the, Earth, the moon's always showing us at the same face. How did it ever figure out to point the same face at us? It's because of this slight discrepancy between the center of gravity and the center of mass. They're not at the same location. And this distorted the moon a little bit. It pulled it out around a little bit and got it, it's now locked, where it's always pointing the same face toward us. So, so if nothing else, that's a sort of interesting factoid, that the far side of the moon, prior to the Apollo missions, where they went around, and, and, and the other satellites that went around the moon, no one could, had ever seen the back side of the moon, the far side. It was just simply never visible from Earth. So that was something in the, in the 60s, the first views of the back side of the, of the moon. So kind of big, a big deal. All right, now there's an app for that. All right, um, what else? So center of gravity. So another way to think about the situation in which this is perfectly balanced 
is when the center of gravity of the seesaw with its riders is located right at the pivot. At that point, gravity is effectively pulling down on the seesaw right at the pivot. There is no lever arm left. Zero lever arm, therefore zero torque. So balanced objects are supported right at their center of gravity. No matter how complicated the object is, if you support it right at its center of gravity, it will experience no torque due to gravity. Okay? And there's lots of examples of this when you're setting things. Nah, I, I, I could go on at length about finding random samples. Mobiles, when you assemble, remember the, the hanging mobiles that, that dangle a bar that has from a string and the two arms of the bar go over and they dangle other bars, which dangle other bars and stuff. To have the whole thing stable so the parts don't just simply tip over and, and, and go, go crazy. You want it balanced. And the way you balance it is you put the center of gravity of each each portion of the mobile, you put it where, right where the support is. So there's no torque. All right. Uh, the problem set ha talks. The problem set for number two, which is up there, is about one of these these giant sphere, uh, spherical sculptures, which I hope you've seen and or played with. A, a big granite ball that sits in a water-filled socket, so it spins almost, per, almost freely. Not, but despite the fact that there's almost no friction on this ball, I, I, I'm trying to think whether there's one at the Richmond Science Museum. There's one in Richmond somewhere. I, anyway, um, despite the fact that this thing has almost no friction, playing with it with your hand, which you frequently can do, it, it's really hard to get it, get it rotating fast or slow it down, things like that, it's because it's got huge rotational mass. You know, remember that. You should know that. Um, but it has to be carefully balanced. If, you don't, if it's not balanced, that is, if its center of gravity is not located right at the center of the ball, and it typically isn't when they first cut the ball, they have to work at it. If it's not balanced, it's going to experience torque due to gravity. All right? I'll leave that thing. Um, anything else I wanted to talk about before leaving seesaw? Uh, one last thought is that when you exert torque on something, it exerts torque back on you equally hard in the opposite direction. Um, an example of this would be, say, opening a jar. When you take the jar and you twist it, and I mean, it's a you know, fun one of my questions somewhere along the line, I'll probably ask it of you, is, is to open a jar. You're used to opening a jar that has a certain Thread, threadedness to it. It's called a right-hand thread. Most threads in the, in the, in the world are so-called right-handed threads. Uh, they have a, the spiral goes one way. There are left-handed threads that go the, uh, where the spiral goes the other direction. They're rare. They show up in things like um, in the faucets of, uh, of sinks. To make it so that the, the, the cold water faucet opens this way and the, the warm water faucet opens symmetrically, mirror, mirror image, you have to have one of them have, the, one of them has to have the, the reverse thread. But, but jars all have right hand threads. And when you grab that, that jar lid and you twist it, it undergoes angular acceleration. And when you twist it, it twists back on you. You feel it fighting you, particularly if it's, if it's a stuck jar or you know, a big lid and it's got, it has something sticky inside that was left all over it. It's, you're twisting really hard. It's, it's a tough one. So that's an example of you exert a torque on it, it exerts a torque back on you. Those torques are equal in amount, opposite in direction. Let me just skip ahead to the, this is Newton's third law. But no, we did that. Uh, we did that too. Come on, why is it so slow? I don't, uh, there, there at the bottom is the Newton's third law of rotational motion. It, it, it's uh, not a surprise at all. You sort of torque on something, it exerts a torque back on you equally hard in the opposite direction. Another classic example of this is arm wrestling. Two of you are twisting each other, and you twist your friend one direction. You know, this, this torque is toward, toward me, right? If, I, if I'm fighting you with my right arm. The other person, the torque is towards her. Okay, so the torques are in opposite direction. Your two arms are there exerting equal but opposite torques on each other. The net torque on your arm, however, 
involves only one torque from your friend. And if that were all there were, if you just let your friend just clobber you, thunk, that their torque is the only torque your arm experiences and you lose. Does that make sense? If you don't, if you don't try, you just let your arm be out there, a chunk of meat that your friend then exerts their torque on, you lose. So what do you do? You, you exert a second torque on your arm using your shoulder. Your arm experiences two torques, one from your friend in the losing direction, and you ex your body exerts a second torque on your arm in the winning direction. The issue is, who, who exerts the larger torque on your arm? Your friend exerting it one way, the losing, or your shoulder and body exerting the torque in the winning direction? Do you understand? You okay with that? I'll summarize it because it's actually worth making sure you, you catch it. The torque you the torque you and your friend exert on each other are equal and opposite, but they are exerted, as is typical of Newton's third laws, they're exerted on two different things. Your friend's torque is exerted on your arm. Your torque is exerted on your friend's arm. They do not cancel in and of themselves. You never, there's no sense in summing them because they're exerted on different objects. The behavior of your, your own arm, however, depends on probably on two other torques. Well, two torques. One of them is your friend's torque on you. It does not involve your torque on your friend. That's your friend's business. The one torque your friend exerts on you is in the losing direction, and the torque that your body exerts on your arm is in the winning direction. The question is, which of those is stronger? If you can exert more torque in the winning direction on your arm than your friend exerts on the, in the losing direction on your arm, you will win. OK? With that, I'm going to leave seesaws. You see how it's going. Um, the world of torques and rotation. And that will bring me to wheels. So this wheels is, for me, it's, it's introducing yet another force. Friction. We talked about support force, which is a force that two surfaces exert on each other, their for support forces, that, that are perpendicular to surfaces. So if I push my hands against each other, each one is exerting a force, in this case, horizontally. My right hand is pushing my left hand horizontally to the, to the right. My left hand is pushing my, my right hand. I, I can't keep straight. They're pushing each other in opposite directions. Friction. Is the frictional forces are in the other possible direction, namely along the surface, parallel to the surface. So, nah. The ball right now is experiencing a, a support force upward that happens to cancel its weight. If I scoot the ball along the surface, it experiences a second force, a frictional force that's along the surface in the direction of the surface. And that's, so that's the story of wheels. You, know, you, can, you can already see that, that, that the, the ball wants to roll when you do this. It wants to become a wheel, and we'll talk about why that happens. OK, so this question has never been a great one, but it's because you, you'll get the answer uh, easily. You're stopped at a red light in your car, and the light turns green, and you want to accelerate forward as rapidly as you possibly can. You do, so you hit the accelerator, but you know that if you hit the accelerator too hard, since this is your Ferrari you're driving, you hit the, the accelerator too hard, the wheel will begin to spin, even though it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll churn on the, on the pavement, it'll skid on the pavement, and black smoke will shoot out, and you'll leave a, a, a rubber sk uh, skid mark on the pavement. Do you want to, to accelerate forward as rapidly as possible? Do you want to stay just short of that skidding motion, or do you want to actually go into the world of skidding, where your wheel is actually spinning on the, on the pavement? You OK with the question? How many think that you want to skid your wheels to accelerate faster? How many think you want to barely avoid skidding your wheels? You're right. You want to barely avoid skidding wheel, your wheels. It's, this is true for conventional rubber tires. Um, and they, and what, it, what it has to do with is there are actually two types, and there are two basic types of friction. There are, actually, there are actually a number of them. But the two classic types of friction involve, are di they differ from one another in, in this respect. 
there is what's called static friction, where two surfaces are trying to slide across one another, but they have not yet started sliding. So they're fighting each other. Um, so imagine, for example, a file cabinet sitting here on the, in front of us, and you, you start pushing on it, and initially nothing happens. The file cabinet does not undergo any acceleration. Something about the, the connection between the floor and the file cabinet is exerting a force back on the file cabinet so that it's fighting your push on the file cabinet. You push, you push a little, nothing happens to the file cabinet. Evidently, friction, the ground, is pushing the file cabinet the opposite direction and, and stymieing you. So you push a little harder. It pushes a little harder. Harder still, it pushes harder still. Finally, you give it a huge shove, and you win. The, the friction from the ground, the static friction from the ground, it's called static because it involves no motion. The static friction gives up. And suddenly, the file cabinet begins to slide. And if you remember these sorts of behaviors, you probably remember that once it gets going, it's easier to keep going than it was to get it started. Can you, can you remember that experience? And it's typically true that once the motion, once you've got the file cabinet actively sliding across the surface, it's no longer static friction that's pushing on it. It's still experiencing friction, but it's, it's, a, it's a friction that, that involves motion. So it's sometimes called dynamic friction uh, to be sort of similar to static. I call it sliding friction. Call it what it is. It's act, the act of sliding. And once those two surfaces are, are actively sliding across one another, they, they exert a different kind of friction. And it's usually weaker than the original static friction. And that's the point of this question. That when, you, when your wheels grip the pavement and don't slide across it, they're experiencing static friction. When they, when they break free and begin to slide across the pavement, even though you may not be, the car may not be moving, the, the surface of the tire is sliding across the surface of the, of the road. That's usually a weaker force, the force of, of sliding friction. And so that's the problem that happens when you skid the wheels. You, you begin to get the, the you, you, you go from static friction to sliding friction. It's usually weaker. You can't accelerate as fast because the forward force on you, on the car, when you, when you hit the accelerator, you know, what exerts the forward force that makes you pick up speed? It is friction from the ground exerted on the tires. And if you spoil that forward force by letting the tires skid, you can't accelerate as fast. Smaller force, same mass, acceleration smaller. On, a, on an icy day, uh, you lose sliding. Both frictions get, get relatively weak, and you can't accelerate very fast at all. That's why it's hard to get started, it's hard to stop, and it's hard to turn on an icy day. You can't get much force from the ground, to, to, and you need that to speed up, slow down, or turn. So next time you're sliding into a ditch, you will be able to explain it all the way. Hopefully you're nice and safe and sound. But you go, oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's weak sliding friction. All right. So some observations about wheels. Friction makes wheelless objects skid to a stop. So I, I keep meaning to. to to take the wheels off my other wagon and put them on this, to let, let this one experience a little bit of the, the, the pleasure of being a, a normal wagon. But it's, it's always been wheelless. And when you get it going, it skids to a stop. So it can't, it, 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 inertia is sort of it, uh, masked for this poor wagon because it's, it's, its motion is so often dominated by friction. Um, friction can waste energy and cause wear. So we'll look at why friction wastes energy. You know this just from, it, it, it's pretty clear that the wagon started moving. I, I, I did work on it to get it going. And then the energy vanished. It had, it had energy in its motion, kinetic energy, and that's gone. Where did it go? So that's part of, of the story to tell you uh, now. So it can waste energy. It can cause wear. You, you, why do tires wear out on a car? Or uh, the, 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 the soles of your shoes? They eventually start, they lose a lot of rubber or whatever's down there, and they get thinner and thinner, and they get out of shape. That's, that's a fric those are frictional effects. Or sta the stairs of ancient buildings uh, that were carved perfectly when they were made, and now, years and years later, they have uh, regions that are all worn down 
and lost an inch or so of, of uh, material. That's all a result of friction. So wheels, the purpose of wheels primarily is to, to, to control friction, particularly the loss of energy and the, and the wear effect. Uh, if you had a car that had no wheels and you tried to drive cross country, you know, among other things, it, it would get terrible gas mileage. And the other thing was it probably would get shorter and shorter and shorter as it leaves itself behind on the pavement. And finally, wheels can be used to propel the, the vehicle. Not only do they, do they allow it to uh, head without, without wasting energy, they actually can push it, help push it forward. So the first question is, why do you need wheels? And this is really the story of friction. So I'll go on, on to that question. So why? Why the wheels? And friction, in general, fights relative motion between surfaces. So what does that mean? So if you've got two surfaces, well, two surfaces that are trying to slide, so that's, that's as I said, was static friction. If I, tr if I push gently on this wheelless wagon to the right, nothing happens. I'm, I'm pushing. I have to push gently because this does not get very much static friction. Here, I'll help. It turns out the, the forces of friction typically are proportional, some proportional to how hard the surfaces are pushed together. So if I push the surfaces together more firmly than they are at present, the forces of friction will get stronger. And I can do that. Right now, I'm having, I'm having trouble showing you static friction because I push even pretty gently and that guy starts moving. But if I push the surfaces together harder, now, now it, I, can, I can wrap away at this thing and nothing happens. Much more friction. This, this should be familiar with, with you know, a full file cabinet is a lot harder to get started moving across the floor or, and, or keep moving across the floor. If you, if you unload it, you take all the, the junk out of it, it's a lot easier to, to move. The, the, that's, that force gets weaker. Another, you play public service now. Years and years ago, you know, car, the cars the cars would have their engines in front and the propelling wheels the wheels that pushed the car forward were the rear wheels this was this is true of in the say the 50s and 60s most cars were like that what's the problem with that well the wheels that propel the car being in the back have almost no weight over them the engine's most of the weight of, you know a huge fraction of the weight of a car is the engine so it's in the wrong side of the car it's over the wrong wheels the, the, the wheels that propel the car have almost no weight on them. The traction that they get, the, the frictional forces that, that they're able to obtain are related to how much weight is being supported by those wheels. And there's not much weight. So the traction sucks. So rear wheel drive cars, they're still, still around, but they do not get good traction, particularly when you're in a bad situation like ice, when it's icy. They just skid their wheels. Okay, so it was really a, a big, good, big deal when cars started drifting towards having front wheel drive. The front wheels were the ones that propelled the, that propelled the car because they have this heavy thing, the engine sitting on top of them, which helps them get good grip, good traction. And ideally, the, the, the best traction is, is cars that propel all the wheels, but putting the weight on the so, so front wheel drive cars are better for, for uh, avoiding getting stuck in, this, in, in ice than rear wheel drive. You, you follow that okay? All right. So what else about this stuff? So the frictional forces, just to point out, the frictional forces are certainly parallel to the surfaces. So if I get this guy started, it slows to a stop. That means that it was heading with a velocity to the right, which it gradually lost. To lose a rightward velocity, you have to accelerate opposite the velocity, which is leftward. So the force of friction exerted by the table on the, the wagon was toward the left. Is that okay? If I get the wagon moving towards the left, the force of friction brings it to a stop again. This time it had a leftward velocity, which it lost, and that involved a rightward acceleration. The main observation here is that friction's smart. It always pushes in the direction that, will, that, that acts to get rid of relative motion. So if the, if the 
if the wagon is, is trying to move leftward along the, along the table, friction tries to fight that, that leftward motion relative to the table by pushing the, the wagon to the right, and in the reverse if it's going to the right. So friction always pushes opposite the relative. So, so if you sit on one surface and look at the other surface, friction's always pushing in a way to bring the second surface, the one you're looking at, to the same velocity as the first surface. It wants them to be going together. And an example of that is when it comes to a stop. When, when, the, when the wagon has actually stopped, its bottom surface has the same velocity as the top, as the top surface of the table. So that's, that's the general rule for friction. It never pushes in the direction of relative motion. You okay with the concept of relative motion? The motion of, of one surface as viewed by the other, other surface. That's, that's, the, that's looking at relative velocities. It's actually sort of an important topic in general, but it's coming up in here in the context of friction. And friction fights any of those relative velocities. And it, it fights by way of forces along the surfaces, parallel to the surfaces. They also come in Newton's third law pairs, like, like all forces. When the table pushes this wagon to the left, the wagon instantly pushes the table to the right. You don't notice it because the table's attached to the whole earth, and it's basically it's too much mass for you to notice. But if, if it were pushing on something much less massive that could move, it would take, it would take that thing with it. Um, I'm trying to think of, I could come up with artificial examples, but that's, so. Um, reminding you the distinction between those two forces, the static frictional force and the sliding frictional force. The static frictional force is the one that, that, that's present before sliding occurs. So if I begin to push on this guy, but it doesn't yet begin to slide, the table and wagon, they're both pushing on each other. And the force that, that with static frictional forces, and the static frictional force that the table exerts on the wagon is adjustable. Right now it's zero. If I push with one newton to the right on the wagon, the, the static frictional force of the, of the table pushes with one newton on the wagon to the left. The result is the wagon experiences no net force. My force and the table's force on the wagon, they both sum to zero. But, but it's adjustable. If I push a little harder, the table pushes a little harder. If I push harder still, the table pushes harder still, until finally I, I exceed the limit. And static friction, so static friction is adjustable. The force of static friction that one object exerts on the other is adjustable up to a maximum. At the point when you hit the maximum or exceed it, static friction gives up, and the surfaces do begin to slide across one another. The microscopic story behind this behavior is that, that surfaces are not perfectly smooth. They have, they, they, they have structure to them. Even at the atomic level, finally, the atoms, the atoms have structure. Um, and so the surfaces aren't perfectly smooth, and they therefore touch one another and to some extent interdigitate. You can imagine that, that the top surface of the table has these various structures on it at the microscopic level, and the bottom surface of the wagon has structures on it at a microscopic level. And they get I interwoven kind of like two hairbrushes. Take, you know, one hairbrush with its bristles up, other hairbrush with its bristles down, they get interlocked. And when you're summoning up static frictional forces by trying to slide one hairbrush across the other, they grab onto each other and they fight you by way actually of support forces, microscopic support forces. And you can't get them started sliding across one another until you push really hard on the hairbrushes and then whoosh, they begin to slide, at which point the bristles begin bouncing off each other and that's, that's now sliding friction and it's weaker in most cases, because the bristles don't sort of have time or opportunity to settle into each other and get really locked. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the microscopic story of friction, both static and sliding. It's not, it's not a perfect uh, uh, analogy, but it's pretty close. All right. So uh, the, it, 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 an added piece of that story is that when you push the two surfaces together harder by loading down say that wagon, you're causing the bristles to interdigitate more. More parts of this, this not perfectly flat surface touch one another. 
the contact points increase and consequently you get more friction as a result. All right. We've already discussed this. You, you want to accelerate forward as fast as possible. You don't want to slide the, the, the rubber across the pavement. It does two things. One is it gets a weaker forward force. And the other thing is it wastes energy and wears out the tires. And that's another part of the story. Um, in fact, you know that it's, it's wasting energy. We'll see why it's wasting energy in the next, next question. Uh, you know the wear is occurring because you tend to leave rubber behind on the pavement. So if you've seen skid marks from cars that, that are either trying to accelerate fast or trying to brake fast, um, you're now living in an era where, where cars, you're still driving them pretty soon. You won't even be driving them. They'll be driving themselves. You have like automatic chauffeur, and that just like will kill some of my, my stories. But, but uh, you're in an era of anti-lock brakes, where you, when you stomp on the brake, the wheel doesn't actually stop dead. It's the, wheel, the wheels still are they're trying to maintain static friction. They're trying to keep uh, from, from sliding. They're trying to avoid skidding. Um, so it's harder and harder to skid your wheels. You can do it, but it's not, it's, uh, your, your car will try to defeat you when you try to do that. It used to be I could go out in the car on a, on a snowy day with my, with my kids. We, we would ride, we'd do donuts in the, in the parking lots on the snow and skid everywhere. It was so great. And now the cars are so, com are so sophisticated, they're hard to make them skid. There's no fun anymore. There should be a switch. Turn off all the, all the high tech. <laughs> go out there and just. All right. So, so skidding wears out your tires. The, the physics behind that is pretty simple. The microscopic physics. Imagine if, when you are skidding, the, 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 the hair brushes across each other. They're, they're smacking into, the, those bristles are smacking into each other and knocking each other plenty. And they actually can get broken off. And that's what's going on microscopically. When you drag something across, when I drag the wagon across the table, microscopic features of the table pointing up and of the wagon's bottom pointing down are getting broken off just by impacts. And so that's, that's the causing this, this wearing phenomenon. When you, when you walk, every time you scuff your feet, you know, you, you did poorly on some paper, got a grade you don't think you deserve, and, and you're doing this, you're wearing out your shoes because you're leaving behind microscopic por portions every time they, they skid across the floor. The other thing that happens is that you are wasting energy. And the way to see this is when I skid the, too much weight here. When I, when I let this guy skid to a stop, it clearly accelerated here. And so you know there are forces going on. The question is, these two surfaces might be doing work on one another, or might not. And the question, so the question is, who's doing work on whom? The, the, the wagon and the table. Is the wagon doing work on the table, positive, negative? Is the table doing work on the wagon, positive, negative? So here, here are the answers. We'll, we'll finish up with this, this question. What work is being done, positive or negative? How many think, A, the table does negative work on the box, and that's the only work that's visible in the story? OK. How many think that the box does positive work on the table? How many think that both objects do positive work on one another? OK. How many think that both objects do negative work on one another? A okay, few votes. How many think the box does positive work on the table, and the table does negative work on the box? OK, the vast majority are going for E. Let's take a look at that. The box, I'm going to, have to look at the second half first. The table does negative work on the box. Well, as the, as the box is skidding across there and is coming to a stop, it's being pushed, in this case, to the left by the table. After all, it's losing its rightward velocity. So there's a leftward push on the box by the table. And the box is moving rightward. That's negative work. The table is doing negative work on the box. It's pushing the box to the left, and, the bo and, and the, yet the, the box is moving to the right. Negative work. So far, so good. E's looking good here. But the, ta the box pushes the table to the right. That's Newton's third law. If the, if the table pushes the box to the left, the box has to push the table to the right. So, that, so there's a rightward push on the table. But is the box doing the wagon, doing work on the table? What other part of the store? What, what else is necessary for the wagon to do work on the table? 
distance. The table has to move a distance in the direction of the, of the wagon. And for all practical purposes, it does not move. Yeah, the, the, the tiniest microscopic movement, maybe. But so there is there's no positive work done on the table. The table does negative work on the box. It sucks energy out of it. But the box doesn't do any positive work on the table. The energy vanishes, or so it seems. What's actually happening is the energy is being ground up into thermal energy in the two surfaces. They are skidding, microscopically, they're crashing and bumping and crashing and bumping. The work is being churned into little bitties. And you can't see it anymore. It's still there. But it didn't go in as mechanical energy into the table. Instead, it goes into th as thermal energy in the table. It gets hot. You know that th that's this stuff. You rub your hands together and they get hot. You're, you're grinding up work into tiny pieces and making thermal energy. So that's where we'll continue on Monday.